Good morning, everyone. My name is Mireya Solis. I am the Night Chair in Japan Studies and Co-Director at the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. It's really a pleasure to welcome this very distinguished group of panelists. And I would like to start by thanking Minister Amari for a really uh, deep uh, set of insights that he shared with us. I think that he has correctly highlighted what is an essential issue for US and uh, Japan going forward, and that is how to deal with a rise in China and a China that now has this larger uh, digital footprint and is using it to uh, uh, these uh, purposes that uh, Minister Amari highlighted. And also, I very much appreciate his comments on the significance of the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. So I think that Minister Amari has already put on the table uh, many significant issues for all of us to discuss. Uh, before we do so, I would like to then uh, introduce our other uh, guests. So if I may, um, Yoshimasa Hayashi is a member of the House of Councillors from the Liberal Democratic Party. Currently, he serves as the Minister of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. And as his, his, <laughs> his past cabinet positions include Minister of Agriculture and Minister of Defense. Um, Ryan Haas is Rubenstein Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program, and before joining Brookings, he was a director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at the National Security Council. Koichiro Gemba is an independent member of the House of Representatives, and previously he was a member of the Democratic Party of Japan and served as a Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for National Policy, among other uh, positions. Minister Amari already... I'm independent. Independent, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Akihiko uh, Tanaka is president of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, GRIPS. And between 2012 and 2015, he served as president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency. So as you could uh, reflect, based on Minister Amari's keynote uh, uh, speech today, we're indeed uh, living in very important, uh, fluid times. There's so much to discuss. We need to talk about the role that the United States is going to play in the international economic system. We need to talk about how to deepen U.S.-Japan economic relations at a time when um, the United States government is talking about a bilateral agenda. And uh, Japan is insisting that the Trans-Pacific Partnership has tremendous value, especially when we consider the role that China is acquiring, again, in international economic governance. And I think there's a very significant agenda as to how Japan and the United States could work together in addressing constructively, but effectively, uh, the China challenge. Now, um, because Minister Hayashi has to catch a plane and he joined us just for a few minutes, I want to ask Minister Hayashi if you could reflect also on the mm -hmm. remarks uh, from uh, uh, Minister Amari. Mm -hmm. And especially uh, when it comes to the TPP and the fact that the TPP has had a second lease of life. Mm. If I uh, may recall, a year and a half ago, when uh, President Trump made good on his promise to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, I think it's fair to say that the conventional wisdom was that the TPP was finished, mm. that the agreement would die because the United States was not part of it. And we know that Japan's leadership has been instrumental mm. in delivering a very different outcome. Um, so the, the question I have uh, for you um, is, how come Japan was able to be proactive at this very critical juncture, mm -hmm. given that many people had assumed that Japan would always play defensive, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. when it came to trade because of its own sensitivity, say, mm -hmm. on agriculture? Yeah. So yeah. where does Japanese leadership spring from? Thank you, Soria, for... Uh... First of all, good morning, everybody, and thank you for your consideration uh, to speak me, let me speak fast to catch the airplane to go into Beijing. So uh, uh, the trade and China is uh, not my jurisdiction as a uh, minister for education, culture, science, technology, sports. So <laughs> let me speak as a former uh, agriculture minister and I had a very fond memory of uh, working together with Mr. Amari Zen, the chief negotiator of TPP, and he is always bunging me. Why do you do more, right? <laughs> but uh, now we uh, uh, <coughs> came to the conclusion. And what happened before and after TPP? Because uh, 
Uh, agriculture situation really changing in Japan, uh, thanks to TPP, and prior to that, there was uh, Australia-Japan FTA trade negotiation, and it's already started in action. So uh, that's a mindset change in Japanese farmers and growers that uh, we can not simply defending ourselves, but we can do offense. Offense means not attacking somebody, but export. So if you notice that our products is very nice, you know, uh, Japanese cuisine is number one, a popular cuisine in all over the world now, uh, especially after the Milano Food Expo uh, s several years ago, why not export uh, which produce the Japanese cuisine? So that's why when I get the position uh, late uh, 2012, uh, I you know, consult with Prime Minister and uh, let's set the target, doubling the export from uh, almost uh, 4 point billion US dollars at that time to 1 trillion yen, which is doubling in almost the seven years, uh, aiming the year of the Olympic game. It doesn't matter, Olympic or Paralympic, or, but the, the, that's the setting goal. And the, nobody believes at the beginning that we could do that. But now, last year we see $8.0 billion. It's already almost doubled and reaching to that one trillion yen goal uh, two years left. So I think, uh, the, for example, Japanese beef, maybe you have heard about or you have eaten Japanese uh, very nice uh, Kobe beef or something like that. But now it is sold in London famous market that hundred dollars per hundred gram. So it's almost double the price in Japan and they're selling the same quality of Australian beef at the 60% of that and the domestic beef is uh, less than 10% of that price. So if you started to sell that, and if you have a nice brand image, and if you have a nice marketing, then we can export. And that now uh, have more wider uh, acceptance and wider range of the understanding in Japanese growers too. So the mindset is changing, but while uh, still very small size farmers in Japan is producing lies, but also we started reform for this uh, uh, main uh, growing in, in Japan so that the more accumulation of land to a more younger and energetic farmers, whereas the elderly farmers are retiring. So we are doing uh, uh, prefecture by prefecture have some uh, type of the farming uh, land bank so that they can accumulate that. And also uh, we abolish the agriculture subsidy uh, starting this year, actually, or last year, uh, so that uh, rather than uh, relying on the subsidy, uh, regardless of the quality uh, it, which is paid, uh, we abolish that and use that budget for income insurance, so that if something bad weather happens, the market goes down, income insurance covers that loss. But if you make more sales, than that, then you will enjoy that. So the farmers becoming more like independent, uh, uh, you know, uh, manager, uh, rather than just making the same things and selling the same price to the Nokia. And ma now Nokia changed also that the, the uh, trading sector of the Nokia already talking about joint investment in former East European countries to produce some of the, uh, t using Japanese technologies, producing some of the grapes to uh, make some wines over there. So it's changing in Japan, but still there's a mindset still remains that uh, they have to be protected. So we have to be very careful about the political meaning of uh, further opening up the e as an image, because two years ago, our party lost almost all the uh, upper house seat in Tohoku areas, so still, there's some, uh, this is also the flip side of the, of the coin, that image still uh, very strongly hated by the, uh, uh, as general, that more opening up in the Nikkei uh, newspapers. But that kind of article is still uh, not so good for a political meaning. So uh, having said that, 
Uh, just briefly on China, because I'm visiting Beijing from now, I hope that the budget is a hidden uh, abbreviation for Bad Japan, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, since uh, I really echo with the, uh, what Ms. Amari said, that we thought that maybe China will hit the middle income trap. But using that budget strategies, they are now having innovation, quote unquote. And maybe by doing that, they can circumvent the middle income trap. So innovation is, seems to be happening because they're bringing those innovation from the United States to have that for uh, 1.2 billion people. That's the biggest market in the world. So that's why uh, how those innovation evolves in China, whereas which resulted in the more bigger economic power, which resulted in more defense spending so uh, that we have to think together uh, bilaterally with the U.S. and Japan. And I stop here and really looking forward to listening to your debate, but sorry about uh, leaving soon to catch the flight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Hayashi, for those uh, excellent comments. And I concur completely with the importance of domestic measures that allow countries to be more proactive. Mm -hmm. I think that in the United States, we have painfully learn uh, that lesson with uh, the situation we find ourselves in, and also the importance of domestic politics, and I want to get that in a second. But I also wanted to ask Minister Amari if he could reflect about that decision point when uh, Japan decided that it would put its uh, weight behind resurrecting TPP. Uh, you were the leading uh, negotiator of the uh, original TPP, so if you could share what was your thought when you saw the United States actually leaving the agreement? And what do you think then carried the day in deliberations among um, government officials in Japan that indeed the TPP should continue uh, and that Japan should be playing this proactive role uh, now? Uh, TPP-11 というのは、あの、1枚のペーパーだけです。TPP-12というのは数千ページにかなるものです。ですからTPP-11、TPP-12が合意に至ったからまあ、あの、交渉が成り立ったことは事実で。now, TPP-11 is concentrated into one sheet of paper, whereas TPP-12 originally had thousands of pages. Um, so that means that TPP-11 was possible because there was an original negotiation on TPP-12. TPP-12 was the most え、途上国がこれだけそのハイスタンダードについてこれるかっていうことでした。で、これは、え、彼らは勇気を持って克服をしました。その一番大きなそのモチベーションになったのはですね、TPPという外圧を利用して国内改革を図るという決意をしたから
And there were two things that struggled with uh, regarding the developed countries. Uh, one is about the U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, uh, just could not decide. Um, they would uh, uh, not decide until five minutes before the time limit. Canada. Wish was she. The second was Korea, uh, as you heard, wishy washy. Canada. Canada, I'm sorry. The TPP 11 demo, the Pasayo Made Kuro Stanoa, Canada, or Set Tok Surukoto, that was short. And um, uh, what I understand is that uh, also during the TPP 11 negotiation, uh, the negotiators uh, struggled um, th- throughout the, the negotiation and uh, to the very end to convince Canada. But Canada, uh, no, uh, Davos <laughs> Uh, at the same time, the uh, Minister of Canada uh, said uh, in Davos that uh, this was my achievement. <laughs> but, but in the end, it all worked out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, Minister Amari. So I would like to bring uh, Minister uh, Gemba and talk about uh, the domestic politics because now we have a signed uh, comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement that now must be ratified. And it's interesting in the news that Mexico was the first country uh, to ratify uh, just a few days ago, the uh, TPP-11. And uh, you know, Japanese politics is going through an uh, interesting period, uh, to put it mildly, uh, today. Um, so, uh, do you expect that there would be a delay in diet deliberations regarding the TPP ratification because of uh, the political situation? How do you uh, uh, see, um, from a different point of view, from a different now an independent, the prospects for uh, TPP ratification, the new TPP ratification in Japan timeline, for example? Mano. <laughs> 国会の対応についてのご質問でありましたけれど確かに日本としてはできるだけ早く国会を通したいというのが政府の意思だというふうに思います This was a question about how the diet session will go regarding this issue. Um, of course, the government's intention is to pass uh, the bill as soon as possible in Japan. でもあの政府がその気ならですね、え、今は与党が圧倒的多数なので、ま、様々なスキャンダルで、え、国会が止まったりもしておりますけれども、強い意思があれば、え、さほどですね、え、通過に時間がかかるとは思えない。uh, however, if the government is very serious, I do not think it will take very long time since a government uh, or ruling party has the overwhelming majority in a diet. Uh, although um, a diet session um, sometimes um, halts because of some scandals within um, the, the uh, political world, but with the strong will of the government, I think it's possible. え、問題点があればですね、それを指摘するのは一つの責任だというふうに思います。But of course, um opposition parties uh, have their own roles. So if there is any issues, then uh, that's their responsibility to point that out. ただですね、あの、あまり先生が、ま、先ほど非常に素晴らしい話を私はされたと思いますし、また TPP 12 をまとめた uh, mm. Well, at the same time, um, uh, Mr. Amari made uh, excellent points earlier, and I, I think the achievement is uh, rather significant that now today we have TPP 12. あの、実は交渉の前段階で、アメリカのオバマ政権からTPPをやらないかと言われたときに、私がたまたまあの担当大臣でした。So before um, 
even before everything started, uh, um, the negotiations started, I just happened to be the minister uh, responsible for these issues when um, Obama administration proposed uh, the idea of TPP to us. Um, I was the um, Minister of um, a State uh, for the um, uh, domestic strategy uh, within the Cabinet Office. And uh, at that time, uh, I stressed the importance and significant, uh, significance of TPP in terms of a strategy as well as our economy. TPP 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 um, if you look at or if you compare TPP-12 uh, against TPP-11 that is without the U.S. and just look at the Japanese side and on a very short term, there might be more shortcomings than the benefits to Japan. そういうソフトな必要な国際公共財を提供してくれる状況にないので、日本としてですね、それをしっかり、サポートするというか、日本としてこの自由貿易あるいは法の支配なんかもそうなんですけれど、そういったソフトな公共財を提供するそういう責任
that the United States has much greater benefits uh, to reap from uh, rejoining TPP than starting from scratch a bilateral negotiation, something that we'll also come to discuss in a few minutes. But I want to transition to the China challenge, because that has been, I think, an overriding concern in our conversation. So I want now to put it front and center and to bring uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Ryan Haas, and Professor Tanaka to this discussion. Um, Minister Amari, in his keynote, talk about this ecosystem that the Chinese government and some companies are creating, where the Chinese government may facilitate access in exchange for information, and very much discussed events in the digital uh, 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 space and the connection to the Belt Road Initiative. So I thought it would be beneficial now uh, if we could discuss, for example, Ryan, if you can get us started, and then Tanaka uh, Sensei, if you can also share, what do you think are China's objectives and motivations behind the Belt Road Initiative? And what can we uh, tell from the way in which some of the projects have been implemented? Is China on track in accomplishing those objectives? Or do we see already significant hurdles to the implementation of that grand connectivity strategy? So uh, Ryan and then Tanaka Sensei. Thank you. Well, thank you, Maria, for including me in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could, I'd like to start out where uh, Minister Amari stopped, which is, uh, I think, at the root of any conversation that we have here or in Tokyo or anywhere else, uh, it's important to have a recognition that the cornerstone of U.S. strategy in Asia is our alliance with, Asia, with Japan. And, and everything needs to start from there. Without a strong, stable, steady, uh, solid alliance with Japan, it's really not possible to uh, advance U.S. strategy the way we like. To, to address uh, Maria's question about the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the conventional wisdom in Washington, which I think is familiar to many people here, is that it's part of a grand Chinese strategy to, to establish centrality and to eventually domi dominate uh, the region and, and eventually the world. Uh, and I don't dispute that necessarily, but I think that uh, using such a caricature sort of underappreciates the drivers of Chinese policy behind the Belt and Road Initiative. From my perspective, it's, uh, it's much more instructive to look at the initiative from the inside out rather than the outside in. In other words, I think that there are very significant domestic drivers that are pushing forward the Belt and Road Initiative. And I'll just offer a few to, to kick off the conversation. Uh, the, the first is China has excess capital that uh, it needs to find a productive outlet for. And if it does not, uh, it runs risk of inflation inside of China. And so the Belt and Road Initiative provides a vehicle for getting capital outside of China in pursuit of productive uh, uh, investments abroad. Similarly, uh, we all know that China has a problem with excess capacity. It produces too much steel, too much cement, <coughs> too much aluminum, too much of, of many things. It needs to find a place to send uh, all this excess capacity. And if it doesn't, uh, it will have to shut down factories and risk localized spikes in unemployment, which is a problem that the Belt and Road Initiative is trying to address. Uh, the third, uh, as Infrastructure projects inside China begin to slow down, and China's economy transitions from an investment-based economy to a more consumption-based economy. Its state-owned enterprises need somewhere to go and something to do. The Belt and Road Initiative is designed to advantage Chinese state-owned enterprises. And then fourth, uh, I think that it is a useful tool for President Xi in terms of building uh, morale and unity of purpose within China and stoking pride within China that China is embarking on a grand historic project. Uh, it's something that everyone in China can understand, appreciate, and it, it invokes China returning to its historic place uh, at the center of uh, a hub and spokes model throughout Asia. So uh, all that to say that there certainly are uh, very clear strategic objectives. I think that Minister Amari outlined several of them this morning. Uh, it's clear that China would like to establish standards around the world. It's clear that China would like to position itself as a center of, uh, of Asia and, and abroad. Um, but unless we understand uh, what domestic problems China is using the Belt and Road Initiative to try to address, I don't think that we can fully appreciate uh, where the initiative will be headed. Excellent. Uh, Tanaka Sensei? I believe um, the uh, broad goal of a Belt and uh, Road Initiative is to achieve what uh, many Chinese call China's dream. Um, however, uh, what does China's dream uh, constitute uh, uh, means many things to many different people. And uh, 
in my understanding, uh, Belt and Initiative uh, uh, are uh, the result of uh, uh, various pressures, as Ryan just mentioned, from uh, uh, China. And so, in the end, it's a, it's a sort of a mixed bag, um, uh, which, uh, with the uh, potential of uh, China's, uh, uh, the power of cash, uh, a lot of people have been frightened. Um, but I think um, uh, today's uh, uh, keynote speech by uh, Mr. Amari uh, has really uh, contributed to uh, focus uh, our attention to one of the key areas uh, of uh, at least concerns of uh, the international friends. Um, so far, I think uh, international uh, attention with respect to Belt and Road initiatives have been more or less focused on uh, China's attempt to uh, uh, build a lot of physical infrastructures, um, railroad, uh, port facilities, and uh, things like that. Um, but in my understanding, given a few years' experiences, um, the, um, uh, the, the concerns about those uh, physical infrastructure, big projects, uh, have been rather exaggerated. Mm -hmm. um, the, the chi China has uh, made lots of uh, um, commitments uh, with a huge uh, 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 number of uh, cash that China can you know, uh, bring into. Uh, but many of these uh, projects, if you look at the uh, concrete performance, uh, not uh, uh, you know, quickly uh, implemented as uh, China promised. Um, the, um, well, there are uh, uh, concerns about those uh, uh, fiscal um, infrastructure development. Um, well, firstly, uh, because uh, at least some of them uh, have problems of uh, uh, the uh, debt sustainability for recipient countries. Um, this could uh, risk uh, the sound development of uh, uh, regional countries in the Belt and Road uh, areas. Um, well, Sri Lanka's uh, Hamban Tota uh, port case is quite uh, indicative. Um, uh, when Sri Lankan government uh, found out that they were not able to repay, then, well, they may end up with a, a debt equity swap uh, by which uh, China, uh, Chinese companies gain the control of port facilities. Um, and now there may be certain you know, concerns about uh, railroad projects from uh, China to Laos to uh, Thailand. Um, there there uh, may be some, uh, the problem with debt sustainability for the country uh, like Laos, whose uh, GDP is not so big. Um, and this uh, debt sustainability problem may uh, create certain security concerns um, uh, for the regional countries, particularly to India, um, that uh, with this uh, uh, Chinese expansion to Sri Lanka or Maldives, uh, that might create some security uh, problems. And so th I believe these are important and relevant concerns of Belt and Road Initiatives. But uh, after listening to Mr. Amari's speech, uh, probably uh, our, you know, what, what we really uh, uh, should be concerned about uh, is uh, what might be called digital uh, Belt and Road initiatives <laughs> uh, rather than uh, physical Belt and Road uh, mm -hmm. initiatives. And um, um, because uh, th this uh, doesn't appear to be physically visible, but the uh, implication uh, for uh, the world economy and uh, implication for uh, the content of uh, world order uh, based on uh, uh, freedom of information and freedom of speech. And, um, well, uh, be more serious, I think, uh, the, uh, the freedom of or the continuing uh, viability of liberal democratic systems. If uh, the uh, uh, cyberspace uh, is virtually controlled by one uh, authoritarian country, uh, that could threaten uh, the lives of uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. So let me use that uh, uh, term that you just coined, the Digital Belt and Road Initiative, to bring all of the panelists into this uh, conversation. And that is, how can Japan and the United States work together in addressing this challenge? Um, I see very significant obstacles. Let me lay them out and I hope to get your reactions. One is that, in my opinion, the US government is mostly trying to go alone in confronting China and is using one instrument primarily, and that is tariffs. And um, you know, there is a risk that indeed there could be some kind of trade war between these two countries, and it might not actually even get to the substance of the issue, the root cause of these issues. Then when it comes to digital uh, economy issues, of course, as Minister Amari highlighted, the TPP has very important rules in place, but the United States is not there. And then if you think about a possibility of the European Union, Japan and the United States working together, there are significant differences in how these countries look at the balance between freedom of flows and privacy. So it's not clear that you can bring them all uh, to the same place and articulate and formulate rules. So given these challenges, that there are divisions among industrialized countries, that the United States seems to be pursuing a more unilateral tariff-oriented policy, what can we do to uh, begin to uh, address this very important challenge now and in the next uh, years to come? Any suggestions, any plans of action? Uh, please. Well, I think uh, I understand now uh, uh, really uh, a delegation of high-ranking officials of the uh, Trump administration in Beijing mm -hmm. uh, trying to um, uh, present uh, the U.S. concerns um, and uh, uh, list up all these things that the U.S. want China uh, uh, to do. As uh, Mr. Amari mentioned, uh, most of the things that Trump administration want uh, had been included in TPP, and so much so, uh, if uh, Trump administration had not left uh, TPP, uh, the U.S. could have uh, made uh, the, the, uh, its case much uh, clearly uh, with collective uh, uh, support of TPP 11 countries uh, plus uh, EU. And uh, so, uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a rather moot to, uh, you know, think back on uh, what could have been. But uh, uh, I think uh, under the current circumstance, I personally wish well uh, with the U.S. delegation uh, to make their cases uh, clearly possible uh, to uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, leaders. But I think even from that on, I hope uh, the Trump administration to... Uh, consider uh, this, the, the continuing relevance of collective uh, demand on uh, uh, our Chinese friends. Um, the, uh, I think uh, along with North Korean issues, but uh, the, uh, still there are a lot of rooms that the US and EU and uh, uh, TPP 11 countries to uh, work together. Thank you very much. I'm a Minister Amari. です。つまり、this is actually quite simple. Um, it is to uh, make sure that it's not one way, meaning that um, the capital information and technology that are the sources of value added. These should go uh, should flow both ways, not just one way. Uh, have you ever asked companies who are investing in China of um, the um, profit that they make in China, how much can they bring back to their own country? Their basic policy is that you're very welcome to earn money in China, but your profit stays here. You will reinvest. So what the world is doing basically is uh, using capital, people, and technology to make China more rich. 
これからは情報が付加価値を生んでいきますどれだけ濃密な情報をどれだけ大量に集められるかですこれを AI で分析することによって新たなソリューションが生まれてくるわけですその付加価値をの源泉の情報を一方通行で集められるだけ集めるというルールを世界に敷いてはいけません So going forward,、uh, information is the very thing that will create value, uh, added value. And、um, these、uh, information that are more relevant and in volume will be analyzed by artificial intelligence to create、uh, new solutions. And the, so the information is really the source of、um, added value and the flow. Should never be one way around the world. And we should never create a system where information is flowing only one way. 中国ルールを中国圏内に全部敷いていく今、野心が動き出しているわけです。逆らう国に対応するのは内政干渉です。中国共産党は昨年の共産党大会で外国内政不干渉政策から内政干渉政策に転換をしましたつまり不適切な内政なら中国がより良い方向に指導してあげるということです um, So the ambition of China、um, is starting to move towards、um, implementing Chinese rule to their、uh, sphere of influence And they will resort to intervening to the domestic politics if、uh, those countries、um, resisted to that rule.、Um, in the last、uh, party congress, they shifted their policy from not intervening to other countries' domestic policy to intervening to the other countries' domestic policies、uh, should they carry out a inappropriate domestic policies. They will、uh, give them、um, advice and instructions. この手法としてエコノミックス・ステイト・クラフトを使いますつまり中国に経済の依存状態を作らせます相手の国が中国の方針と違う方針を打ち出した際には経済制裁をして遮断をします無理やりにこちらに向かせるわけです、uh, So one of the tools they use is the economic state craft Uh, what it is is that they,、uh, China would create、um, economic dependency on、um, their partner、uh, country. And if the, uh, that particular country、um, would go against Chinese will in terms of their direction, then they will pose economic sanction, impose economic sanction on the country so that they are fo- forced to follow the rules. フィリピンからの輸出しているバナナそれが通貫できずに止め置かれましたそうしているうちに全部腐りました責任は損害はフィリピンにあるだけです。Uh, for example, um... Philippine went against、uh, the issue regarding the South China Sea against China.、Um... So, as a result,、uh, their、uh, banana, one of their exports towards China, was、um, stopped at the customs and they, were, they stayed there until they rot,、uh, rotted.、Um, and all the damage was on the Philippines. The Dalai Lama の訪問を受け入れていたモンゴルは中国から経済援助を遮断されました。そしてその政策を転換せざるを得なくなりました。Another example is、uh, Mongolia, where they used to、um, accept the visit、uh, from a Dalai Lama.、Um, they, uh, China decided to、uh, cut the economic support to the country, and、uh, Mongolia was、uh, forced to change their policy. First, エコノミックステイトクラフトです。そう、エコノミックステイトクラフト、again、is to create、um, economic dependency in、uh, different countries。and if they、uh, do not、uh, 
uh, act accordingly, uh, then they will um, cut off the economic support to those countries. Thank you, Minister Amari. Uh, Minister Gemba or Ryan, do you have any comments? Ano, sakyodo itta ichiro ni tsuite desu ne. Ma, hitotsu wa keizai se, mo hitotsu wa chugok no digital infra ni tsuite noもう一つ、まあ川島先生なんかがまあ本来専門だと思いますけれど、もう一つ気をつけなきゃいけないのは中国の軍港化というものをですね、軍の港ですね。やっぱりいくつかの国でそれらを測っていると、それはミャンマー
Thank you very much. Ryan, do you have comments? Sure. I, would, uh, I think this has already been a very rich discussion. I will just add two thoughts to what has already been said. Um, the first is that for all the reasons I tried to outline at first, I think that it is a futile exercise to try to stop or obstruct the Belt and Road Initiative. It is going to happen. And uh, the, the question in my mind isn't whether it's going to happen or not. It's how do we shift the conversation from a contest, great power contest, to a race to the top. In other words, um, make the focus on establishing competition so that the recipient countries have more than one option and don't end up trapped in debt for equity swaps, but uh, are able to uh, find a better path forward that serves their long-term interest. And then that leads me to my second uh, thought, which is conceptual. Uh, I think that the, the focus of our efforts needs to be on finding ways to create a more dense and integrated trade and investment framework in Asia so that there's less space for any one country to um, isolate countries and dictate terms to them. The more that we can do so, and I think the TPP is a vehicle for doing so, uh, the better both the United States and Japan will be strategically in the long term. And my final thought, uh, I'm very confident that the United States will join TPP. I just can't tell you when. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, Ambassador Amari and Minister Gimba have made a very persuasive case, uh, and over time I think it will carry the day here. So good American optimism. <laughs> uh, we can uh, use a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So let me bring the audience. You have been very patient. I had uh, many questions. I want to talk about aluminum and steel tariffs. I want to talk about the Motegi uh, Lighthizer dialogue. Uh, but I have to cede that time because it's time for all of you to articulate your questions. If you can please raise your hand and the microphone <coughs> will come to you. Identify yourself, very, very concise, and I'll take two questions at a time because we have just a few minutes left. So I have two, two gentlemen on this side, in the front row and the fourth row. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jesse Wu, a leader consulting, a privacy consulting firm. Um, given the focus on digital economies and um, you know, digital integration, I'm, Curious with the Japanese government's perspective on the the APEC cross-border privacy rules are. Mm -hmm. It seems like by facilitating um, information flows and and data interoperability, that might be seen as a, a kind of counter to to the Chinese um, information practices. So. Thank you very much. And then the gentleman. Thank you very much. My name is Neil Eford, and I'm a retired Foreign Service officer from U.S. Department of State. During the period 1993-97, I served in the State Department's Office for Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, and I witnessed a very successful, in my humble opinion, a very mm -hmm. successful uh, partnership whereby Japan and the U.S. co-chaired APEC. And numerous working meetings, numerous papers, and so forth. Uh, I wonder if this could be strengthened, revitalized, whatever the right word is. Uh, in other words, could we have some bold multilateralism here? Uh, it was always, it began, as people may know, in 1989 with the political objective of maintaining the presence of U.S. and Australia in Asia in the face of ASEAN and China, but it had a very real trade, things with very real trade negotiations on difficult challenges, including most notably, but not only, agriculture. So I just throw that out and wonder if there's anyone interested in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So interestingly, both questions on the potential of using APEC as another platform to pursue an economic dialogue that addresses digital issues and also other market opening exercises. Do you have any views on the potential of APEC? TPP APEC mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, TPP originally um, came from APEC, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> 再活性化するっていうのは一つの方法だと思いますけど、それであの何か新しいものが生まれるかというと必ずしもそうではないのではないかと思います。アメリカがTPPに入るのが一番簡単。<笑><笑><笑> um, 
Well, yes, uh, revitalizing um, APIC might be one thing, uh, one method, uh, but uh, would that create um, something new at this point? Um, I think at this point, um, the U.S. joining the DPP will be um, even uh, much simpler. So you high standard or na rule no naka ni Chugoku o kumikome ba Chugoku wa itte tedo hirakareta rule no naka ni hairazaro e naku naru. And, um, and it goes further uh, where we have this high standard rule, and if we can incorporate China into this set of rules, then uh, they will be sort of forced to be, in, uh, be a part of this open rule setup. Thank you. Um, well, um, the APEC is um, uh, still a very useful. Uh, regional framework because it has uh, so many countries around the uh, Pacific. Um, the, uh, so it has a certain role, but uh, as uh, uh, Minister Gemba uh, mentioned, at this particular moment, uh, for the sake of uh, creating uh, better international rules uh, relevant to the current date, uh, probably uh, we need much higher standards uh, that, that uh, uh, not all APEC countries could uh, easily agree, uh, including China. Um, so I think, um, as I agree with Mr. Gamba, the, the, the best thing uh, is uh, for the U.S. to uh, rejoin TPP. Um, and, um, and then maybe uh, more broadly, if, we are, if our um, uh, um, uh, interest in uh, uh, India and uh, others, we may think of uh, uh, much broader uh, uh, framework, uh, but uh, much broader framework. Again, uh, it, it's uh, best uh, be created by extending TPP. Mm. And uh, uh, sorry to say, uh, you know, uh, the same thing uh, repeatedly. <laughs> but uh, you know, the best thing is for the U.S. to rejoin TPP. <laughs> the message is very clear. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, oh, okay, uh, here. Thank you very much. I'm now Aoyama, now as Aoyama, staff writer for the Asahi Shimbun. Uh, when uh, Mr. Uh, President Trump uh, told his senior aides, including uh, Mr. Lighthizer, to uh, look into the possibility of rejoining the TPP, I think in mid April, uh, some saw uh, that as a move to ratchet up the pressure on China. Uh, but our, I, I think uh, in, in a press conference prior to uh, the Japan US. Our uh, summit meeting, uh, Mr. Cudlow uh, denied the link between the U.S.-China trade dispute and uh, the uh, the TPP. Uh, he said uh, he don't he doesn't we, uh, the U.S. administration doesn't need to the TPP to expedite to solve the uh, U.S.-China dispute. So uh, my question is: To what extent uh, do you uh, think um, the Trump administration really factors? in uh, the ongoing uh, the trade, trade discussion with China uh, in when uh, making their strategy toward the TPP? If, if I can take a, a shot at answering that, I think that um, a lot of what is driving that conversation and why that issue comes to the president's mind is actually more domestic politics oriented. You have to take into account that that comment was made in addressing the concerns of farmers uh, who were very worried about losing access uh, to the Chinese market because they could be retaliatory tariffs. Farmers and agricultural producers are also very worried about the fate of the NAFTA agreement. And they're also very concerned about the possibility that they will not have the best terms of access to the Japanese market now that the United States is not in TPP. But I think that it's also very important to be realistic. It's important to be optimistic, but also realistic. The president shut the door very quickly with a tweet just a few hours later. And I think that there is a concern that as long as he is uh, mostly thinking about bilateral trade deficits, he may lose on the possibility of rule creation and making sure that American producers enjoy the best terms of access in overseas markets. So uh, with that, I think we have to come to an end. So we can, you can please join me in thanking our excellent uh, panelists this morning. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.